In today's video, we're going to be talking about some of the top reasons why construction projects fail, but more importantly, how to avoid these pitfalls on your projects. So let's go! Okay, so with every construction project being unique, there are a million different reasons as to why projects both have the potential to either fail or succeed. Now, issues can range from poor design and engineering to problems with existing conditions, such as unsuitable soils, which for the most part should be totally preventable and will be covered in a future video of mine. Sometimes projects fail massively due to a culmination of all these issues. Take, for example, the Big Dig project out in Boston with an initial budget of $2.8 billion. The current estimated cost of that project is $22 billion based on inflation and interest, which is not expected to be paid off until 2038. The project was started in 1982 and was supposed to have a finish date of 1998. However, the project did not finish until 2007, which is almost a decade overdue. The issues I'm going to focus on specifically in this video are failures that are directly related to project delivery and execution methods. So number one, pre-construction, buyout, and budget. The phase before actual construction is known as pre-construction. This is where the contractor, large or small, takes a look at the project and puts together an estimate along with a project schedule that they are ultimately hoping will lead to an award from the owner. Now, if you're the general or the prime contractor, meaning you're going to perform the work yourself, you need to complete a takeoff or an estimate. A takeoff can be completed with or without a drawing set, but the term is derived from taking information off a drawing and putting it into estimation software or putting a price to it. Now, smaller companies may use a notepad pad and the going rate, mid-sized companies may use Microsoft Excel, large companies may use software such as on-screen takeoff which gets plugged into a program such as Timberline or Destiny that uses historical productivity data rates and cost rates to project these estimates. So using a simple example, let's say that there's 20 light fixtures in a room. Well you count up 20 light fixtures and you can call up the distributor and get a price with shipping and applicable tax. Now we're going to ignore all the conduit cabling and other items in this example and just focus on the light fixture itself. So you have your material material cost, now you need to think about your labor cost. How long is it going to take your electrician to install one of these light fixtures? For new companies working in a competitive bid environment, this is actually the hardest part about being competitive and where failures will start to appear because they don't have referenceable historical data and as a result, they estimate projects using swag numbers, otherwise known as an educated guess. So let's assume the company knows it will take one electrician, 45 minutes start to finish to install one of these fixtures. Stay with me now, we're almost there. So the takeoff or estimate of the room led to 20 light fixtures at 45 minutes each, which would take approximately 900 minutes total, which also equates to 15 hours. So your estimator calculates the hourly billable rate times 15 hours to get your labor cost estimate. So last, these light fixtures are 25 feet off the ground, so you need to account for a lift rental. Well, you know your electrician is going to be working for 15 hours, which is the equivalent of two days to complete this, so you need to include a lift rental for two days at the appropriate rate to account for that. All right, where's the issue? Well, let's take a step back and look at that initial takeoff. Oh no, it looks like there were actually 35 light fixtures in that room and we missed 15 on the initial takeoff. So 15 light fixtures multiplied by the material, labor, and equipment cost is equal to a decent amount of money that's already been lost. Now let's assume that this is just one room within a building that has 45 similar rooms with the same lighting layout. That money's gonna add up faster than Usain Bolt after a Red Bull. So there's really no good way out of this situation and the project is just been set up for failure from the beginning, which is why pre-construction estimating is critical in the project's overall success. So the lesson learned here is attention to detail and being project specific and understanding your project documents. The same issue can actually exist for a construction manager. A traditional CM typically does not self-perform in most scenarios, so their responsibility is to transfer all the scope from the drawing onto other companies. The CM compiles scopes or bid packages and distributes them to subcontractors to take on this work. So essentially they're the middleman managing the scope. Well, when a CM misses something on the drawing set and that doesn't translate into one of those bid packages, therefore it doesn't translate into one of those subcontractors scopes, it's considered a scope gap. The issue is when these contract scope gaps are found after contract award and after contract dollar values are already established, meaning that there's no budgeted dollar amount for this scope gap. Now, if you know about contingency allowances, you know that this is not necessarily the end of the world. So to prevent all these scenarios, you need to thoroughly build the project on paper before you ever step foot 
put in the field. Again, people are working too quickly and it's easy to make these simple mistakes and the dollars add up very fast. I'm gonna drop a link to the RS Means, which is a great resource that talks about costs, crew sizes, and production rates based on historical data, which new companies can use to be competitive. It also includes multipliers based on different cities because the labor in New York is not gonna cost the same as labor elsewhere in rural America. This is a great tool to eliminate some of that guesswork when you're bidding new projects. Number two, scheduling and time allotment. So using that same example, let's recap the electrical portion. If it takes one electrician 45 minutes to install one light fixture and there are 35 light fixtures per room in 45 rooms, that's 70,875 minutes or 1,182 hours or 147.65 days to complete that scope activity. Let's say that we're a subcontractor and we've been given a project schedule that only allows for 50 days and that's what we have to agree to to get awarded this project. Now I just want to mention that construction managers, general contractors, and subcontractors should be talking pre-construction together to ensure that nobody's over committing and that what the construction manager and general contractor are agreeing to deliver to an owner is actually achievable by subcontractor. All right, in this scenario, we've got 50 days to complete this scope, but remember, we calculated that it's gonna take one electrician 147.65 days to complete this scope. Well, most companies manage this by adding more electricians. So if you have three electricians doing the same scope, it's gonna take one third the amount of time. So the three electricians have mobilized onto the job site, they're installing these fixtures, and we notice that instead of taking 45 minutes to complete the install, it's actually taking them one hour per fixture each. So instead of getting done in 50 days, we have to adjust and we're gonna see that it's gonna take 16 days longer. Some projects can have liquidated damages attached to the contract, meaning that if you go beyond your allotted schedule time, you could be responsible for these costs. For instance, an owner's production facility was planning to open 16 days earlier, but with a delay that we caused, the owner is going to lose revenues for those 16 days. Well, if the revenue was projected at $50,000 a day, that's potentially $800,000 in damages that we don't want to deal with. So this scenario is not the result or failure of the field installer. Because all three electricians are taking one hour each, that's the amount of time it takes to install one of these light fixtures. So it was an incorrect assumption on the front end to assume that each electrician would only take 45 minutes to install these light fixtures instead of an hour. Some non-union companies actually offer production incentives or bonuses or pay by the unit rate to ensure production goals are met. This isn't necessarily beneficial to the project because it may lead to fast pace but poor quality or workmanship that may not be accepted by the owner or by the project specifications or industry standards. So when a company finds good employees, they really need to learn to pay them appropriately to make sure that they're keeping those employees happy, the production is good, and schedules are consistent and align with historical data because they have the same employees doing the same tasks. So if you've done all your homework, you've pre-planned and you have a perfect estimate in place and you still cannot meet the requirements of the owner's budget and schedule, smart companies actually walk away from these scenarios to ensure that they're not over committing and forcing situations that will lead to under delivering and ultimately failure. Number three, planning and communication. This is by far the most common failure and is the underlying theme for most construction failures in general. If the pre-construction team prepares the entire project but hands it off to a separate project manager and superintendent without transferring the knowledge and the reasoning of how the project is suggested to be built, the project manager and superintendent have the potential to make inaccurate assumptions, which may be correct in one scenario, but wrong to this specific project. This is why the project team should have a good understanding of what's happening during the pre-construction process and what commitments are being made. If a project manager and a superintendent don't manage the schedule or communicate this information to individuals in the field or other subcontractors, the field individuals are not being set up for success, nor are are the subcontractors. Every task needs to be treated as its own project within the overall schedule. Each major task should be planned out fully as it relates to labor, material, and equipment requirements prior to any field installers actually stepping foot on site. The field trades should know exactly what is to be accomplished and how long it should take to accomplish those tasks within the overall schedule. The field should understand the drawing details as they relate to the specific project. So the project team should be receiving, digesting, communicating, distributing, drawing, and schedule updates updates in a timely and consistent manner throughout the project. Project teams should submit and return RFIs and submittals well before an activity takes place on site through forward planning and forward review. Schedules should be reviewed, updated, and distributed on a weekly and monthly basis. Crew sizes should be established in advance of the project mobilization to ensure that they meet the project schedule. Materials should be scheduled to arrive on the job site on or before the start of the activity.
activity, as well as having all your small and large tools and equipment being planned to be on the job site when needed. Prior to the start of any construction job, there should be a high-level pre-job meeting with all relevant project managers, superintendent, and foreman who will be part of the project to discuss clear expectations on how that project will be run. This needs to be completed prior to mobilization of any trade. Prior to the start of any major scope or activity, there should be a pre-install or pre-task meeting which will recap the plan that has already been worked out and ready for execution in the field. This meeting needs to take place approximately two or three weeks before the trades even step foot on site. This meeting should not be used to figure out the plan as that will be too late in the process. You should have already figured out everything in advance prior to having this meeting established and ready to go. Prior to the start of each day, once the crew has actually mobilized onto the site, there should be a superintendent, foreman, or crew huddle. This is at the start of every morning for each company on site to talk about what the goals and objectives are for that day. So all these issues and all these answers result into one thing, being proactive. You have to understand your project and be able to communicate and pre-plan all these activities prior to them happening. And remember, none of this helps anybody if you cannot communicate. Everyone digests information differently, so it's your job as a future leader to be able to take this information and effectively pass it along. You're going to help make people's lives easier, which in return will lead to a successful construction project. Remember, don't make assumptions that you think will just work themselves out. This leads to the worst case scenario of being reactive on a job site instead of proactive. Strive to be better, keep an open mind, and as always, bye for now. Aww.